Hello all, and this video is going to be a mishmash of different ideas uh, with regards to art and uh, the poetry of one of my favorite uh, artists um, that I think we had the privilege to have in our lifetime, uh, whose life was unfortunately cut short in Michael Larson. But uh, so to begin, I guess I wanted to sort of lay out how this video is possible to begin with. Um, I'm going to use the classic hermeneutic interpretation uh, that Heidegger would even use in his own defense of art with the artist's subjectivity, as we'll examine, uh, doesn't necessarily have to um, uh, play a, a, a significant role in discovering Aletheia, especially in uh, the worlds that the artists create. And so just to describe what good art is, uh, to uh, um, be precise here, uh, good art, uh, especially for Heidegger, is to um, take into account the sort of ambiguity and mystery that um, uh, you know the li that life brings with uh, being in the world. Um, and so, just like with truth, uh, his example of Aletheia, uh, the truth process renders itself through, you know, the questions and dispositions that we bring through our subjectivity into how nature or the truth will reveal itself through objects uh, towards us. It's a very pre-Socratic idea. Uh, he loved the pre-Socratics, uh, wanted to bring that back into his philosophy. And so this is how we question how um, you know, this is objectively considered and how uh, the truth is revealed through our questioning or uh, nature. And so this, I think, plays into, of course, Heidegger being a uh, Husserlian scholar uh, of the highest order. Um, and Husserl has a lot of interesting dichotomies that he builds in his phenomenological method for, uh, you know, for example, like the horizon and the halo of consciousness, which I think will be important for this uh this poetry we're going to look at. Um, and so I want to be as quick as possible so we can get right to it. But one of the interesting ones is the, the dichotomy of, um, you know, the physicalism that Husserl is trying to respect and places uh, something like the primary and secondary qualities with Locke, where, you know, there's objectiveness uh, with, you know, an object, but ultimately, our own subjectiveness and how those, that object will reveal itself uh, through the way uh, we uh, uh, have that in our mental process or consciousness. And so, uh, if I were to use an example and not lose the audience here, uh, you know, the perception of one angle of this chair changes in what uh, is called the concatenations of unity um, so if I, you know, stand behind this chair and look at it from that angle, I still have the unity of perception that the front of this chair is still here, despite the fact that I've changed my perspective. Or if I go at it from sideways, um, you can still have that unity within an object, despite the fact that you're coming at it from a different sort of horizon. And that's true with all objects, as Husserl would say, with regards to, there's always some background, uh, even though you have the directive of your consciousness, there's always some background unity going on to keep that sort of uh, horizon together and um, how, you know, the consciousness is able to just, you know, fluidly do this for us uh, requires that sort of uh, determined horizon, as he would describe. Um, and so... The dichotomy I really want to focus on is the two types of being. Being, of course, in the natural attitude, as Husserl would describe in his arguments, and then also the mental process of actually what the artist does, where they're able to tap into uh, form and um, these sort of um, examples, if you will, or models for what... Uh, 
um, they're trying to describe in their art. Um, and so there's the two types of existence, of course, with um, noumena maybe interesting enough being this sort of physical thing that we subjectively are looking at through the appearances, and then we have the perception through uh, mental process. There's always that phenomenon of objectivity that we'll never be able to reach, which is a really big theme in uh, German philosophy, I think. Um, and so, with those kind of dichotomies set out, I think you can enrich what Heidegger is going to do with his own dichotomies in the origin of art, which is what I really wanted to uh, get at. And so, for Heidegger, there's the dichotomy of the earthly and the world. And so, the earthly is sort of like that sort of natural attitude or that natural process. Um, and for Heidegger, it's much more in the sort of mystery of the earthly is always going to get away from the world building of intelligibility. It's always poking out and jetting out and giving new particulars that we're going to have to re-examine and reassess. And so that's something to discuss, uh, to consider with what Heidegger means with the horizon um, and the sort of discussion of form and ideals that the artist brings uh, to make intelligible for us. Um, and so that is how, you know, art uh, is much more than just the subjectivity of the actual artist. They're, they're in the eidetic form uh, world. And so for Heidegger, uh, in the Western civilization, as he would describe, there's the world picture, the Western perspective of the subject as the force of how objects are unified um, in, the hum in the human uh, subject, sort of creating that sort of objective uh, way we look at things. And of course, off to the side, though, with art itself, and as we'll see in uh, Michael Larson's uh, poems here, Painting perspectivity uh, really gets at this with, you know, the perspective, uh, their perspective of a sort of determined horizon, um, or that sort of determinal, determined field, uh, is also able to uh, express at the same time as all these philosophical discussions are going on and theory is going on. We have, you know, the artist and uh, their ability to also understand that um, world picture. And so for Heidegger, uh, with the, his classification of what you know these things are in the world, he looks at things from the way we create them in two distinctions with equipment and art. So equipment is you know something an object on hand, you know something like a, a pair of shoes or something like that, um, which you know, goes uh, for Heidegger these sorts of objects they just kind of sink into the background unless they're problematized and become an issue but works of art or true art uh, is what he would refer to as a truth event because it reveals the being of beings and the dialogue that uh, I also think is you know enriched in that sort of German tradition of you know, understanding that there's no causal mechanisms for, uh, you know, a great work of art from an artist that comes out of them. Um, but yet, there is this sort of understanding, though, that his own, you know, capacity, his own conduit for Heidegger, uh, you know, an artist is a conduit to that discussion of, of between a people and what the gods are trying to say. Um, so all works of art take elements or particulars of horizons or a field and reorganizes them into the mystery of life, um, that existential Heideggerian concept, um, and taking the earthly and, and, and bringing them out in different ways that you can't do with just uh, you know, creating an objectivity of you know, a, a pair of shoes or something like that, as he describes in The Origin of Art. Um, and so an artist's personal circumstances uh, are trivial and cannot explain the greatness of art uh, and the conduit of that greater process.
So now I want to introduce Michael Larson himself. It was about a 10 minute intro there. I apologize for how long it took, but um, Michael Larson himself uh, sadly uh, passed away October 16th, 2010 uh, after what has been described or uh, theorized as an accidental overdose. There's never been conclusive proof. I don't think his mother is going to ever share that sort of uh, information, which is uh, understandable, but um, Michael Larson, if you don't know, was uh, famous for stepping onto the uh, battle uh, freestyle um, uh, competitions, uh, especially with uh, the televised Scribble Jam and Blaze Battles on HBO and the turn of the millennium. And then, of course, he had um, his own um, albums that uh, had relative success. Um, basically, if he's one of those gems that once you actually you know, find this artist, you realize how good they actually were, uh, even though they weren't uh, known by uh, everyone. And, uh, you know, most people I think that has ever been introduced to his music, music uh, feels more enriched afterwards. Um, not just because, uh, you know, hip hop's really popular, um, but, uh, you know, the richness of the poetry that we'll get into, uh, which I want to start with uh, the first verse. Of course, I would recommend that you actually listen to the song Color My World Mine, which is what we'll be discussing here. But nonetheless, I'll go through in a uh, very monotone tone with uh, not very good rhythm on uh, uh, some of these lyrics to actually uh, go at what I'm trying to say here. And so he starts the song in verse 1 with, I once met a man who trained himself not to dream. What he seems to have seen was a glimpse of everything. He's been painting pictures on canvas since age 13 and claims he only exists in the mind of a higher being. So right off the bat, you kind of understand that Michael definitely understands to some degree, uh, you know, creativity in the sort of absolute, uh, uh, as Hegel would describe. Um, and so as you go on with uh, the verse, um, he describes the uh, painter who uh, paints himself painting himself and all that's in his visual field I think this ties into how you know the artist and perspectivity understood that our human subjectiveness is uh, you know giving us in a sort of paradoxical way how we can objectively you know look at the world and you know you describe that sort of visual field and he said that was the only way he could make himself real Ever since he could remember, he had one nightmare reoccur, but until about ten years ago, it didn't matter. It consisted of loud, distorted sounds echoing off the concrete. He ran on top of it in an attempt to reach a ladder. Now sometimes he'd get so close but never touch his destination, which caused him much frustration because he didn't know what it meant. And by the end of the dream, he saw the scene from a bird's eye only to witness his dead body laying on the cement. It was only to witness his dead body laying on the cement. Okay, so that was a lot there. And um, I think uh, what's interesting about this little part here is you can see perhaps, see this is what's interesting about artists, especially if you take what Heidegger uh, you know, says about the artists. It's not necessarily true that you know Michael Larson may have read all of these German idealists that I'm talking about here, but nonetheless, the artist is still, um, you know, in that sort of realm of, of, of the being of beings and that sort of discourse, uh, which he's able to describe things that are uh, really uh, uh, precedent to us. So you could see when he talks about, you know, the frustration of trying to understand his dream, but also the act of you know, climbing the ladder and not reaching his destination. That's, I think, a description of, you know, not being able for us to reach that sort of noumena uh, phenomenon distinction of, you know, coming together to, to a full understanding. There's no full objective understanding. Um, just as the artist, uh, you know, creates a world, 
uh, an ambiguous one that, uh, um, you know, we can never fully encapsulate uh, entirely. Just like with this, uh, these poems here, we could go back and we'll have a, a you know, different viewpoint uh, because it's good art. But I think that the airplane is also really interesting that there's a, an airplane in this dream. Because I think that um, you know, there's an implicit uh, awareness here of the airplane being as a sort of symbol of, of, of technology, of science and technology, and as this objectifying force. Because, of course, with Heidegger, the artist and science, there's a sort of dichotomy, a tension there uh, that I think is really interesting. Um, so I will continue with the poem here. Um, so he thought it's just a dream and kept living his life, writing his soul on the canvas because it sheds his planet light. And it goes on and on like space and time ain't nothing odd. All right, so I really wanted to get at that particular passage there because I think that uh, it's interesting that he points out that space and time uh, uh, going on within the artist. And then there's also a... Um, uh, another thing to note as, as the as this first verse ends it's not that he didn't believe he just didn't approve of God his experience was one I couldn't comprehend till I stopped being detective and listened to him as a friend he said all right so I want to break that down for a second because I think there's also that sort of Western tradition that Michael's tapped into here with you know our civilization you know using the airplane using technology in that objectifying sense uh has turned away from god has even rejected god uh, wholesale and doesn't even approve of the way in which god has uh, ordered things um you know at this time period when first born that's the name of this album was being recorded um uh, Christopher Hitchens, which was a famous uh, debater and a, a writer for um, the sort of uh, secular atheist movement at the turn of the century, um, it wasn't just that he not only rejected God, right? He also uh, went as far as to saying that uh, you know God is is deceptive, uh, even if he was real, and that sort of disapproval, which was you know, uh, something totally different and, and, and a totally new phenomenon uh, for us in the West uh, that I don't really think is actually uh, considered enough. Uh, but um, now if we're going to go on to verse 2 here, um, this is when it gets uh, really interesting. Um, it's like I said, about 10 years ago, the event that changed his whole reality took place on his monthly trip to the local art gallery. It is where he studied his contemporaries and where he nearly carried his sanity to a hole and buried it forever. It was a very mysterious day. The place was almost empty and he got chills down his spine just being present in the scene. On the wall, there was a picture that looked familiar and when he got it close, his heart stopped because he saw it was a painting of his dream. It was a painting of his dream, his body on a runway by a ladder to an airplane with its propeller spinning, which accounted for the loud noise. The matchup was perfect, and that was the day he stopped believing and existed. He resented his creator. I mean, words can't explain what must have went on in his brain when he stared into a frame. Okay, so now I want to use that to be at the cutoff point. And so I think with verse 2, we're getting at you know a lot of existential themes here. Uh, which is uh, classic for Michael's poetry. Um, and so verse 2, I think we're getting at the questions of uh, uh, and the dialogue, uh, certainly with philosophy, of fate and dealing with one's own inevitable death. Um, and so you have that sort of fate and, and death, and, and where does freedom lie into that with how this is determined and um, you know he's seeing how he will eventually die um, you know uh, just like we all embrace that we're all going to die one day um, you know so how do we contend with that of course that's a you know existential question um, 
And so it's interesting to perhaps consider the philosophy of, of being with you know, different civilizations uh, and how they come out in that Hegelian tradition toward uh, you know, being, being self-conscious within itself. Um, and so, yeah, there's definitely that sort of uh, classic dichotomy of freedom or indetermination through the artist uh, by being tapped into the absolute. You know, who's actually in control here? Is it the artist or is it the being of beings trying to talk to us? Um, incidentally, there's a really interesting painting that perhaps Michael was inspired by with, uh, you know, Norman Rockwell's painting, uh, the triple portrait of him painting himself, painting himself. Um, and so I don't know, I, I couldn't find the exact quote, but um, there's that uh, uh, famous quote where he, uh, I, I believe it was Rockwell, who he said that, you know, he's painting his own happiness, even though he's not actually happy. But uh, I think there's the theme here of, uh, you know, the existential dread of, you know, you still have to live your life, even if uh, uh, you don't have that sort of complete freedom of indeterminate. Um, there's also something to be said that Michael understands here with, you know, aesthetic appreciation and ideas and idealism, you know, away from this sort of physical, natural attitude is, you know, a higher calling, a higher spirit. Um, and so the, the, that sort of self-creativity of the world, um, is, is uh, also interesting to look at here. So I want to continue on with verse 2. I mean, words can't explain what must have went on in his brain when he stared into a frame of a work of art which he created and was at the same time. The mind can't handle that much. It's just insane. It's like reading a book where each word describes your thoughts, and in quotations it reads whatever you say when you talk. You think it can't happen, but it did happen. I guess they're surprisingly wide cracks in each life sidewalk. He stumbled upon an answer when he never had a question and decided to stop dreaming to maintain his mental health. Now he hardly talks to people, just stays in his basement, writing infinity by painting himself painting himself. So yeah, this just described, uh, I might have went a little ahead here, but what I just uh, said in my dialogue of, you know, living your, um, you know, the examined life, uh, as it were, and, you, you know, uh, actually taking action and, and not just taking in this sort of information. Um, so as he continues here, and this will kind of tie it in, this is a strange universe. Is it all just a blueprint? Is the real universe, is, in the real universe, is my consciousness useless? Are we really something a higher intelligence made up, a figment of imagination colored by a cosmic paintbrush? Maybe all of our art creates the fate of other beings, then every character in every novel thinks it's alive and we're just gods, ruling blindly, just a theory. I don't know what it means, but that's the story of the man who trained himself not to dream. Okay, so as we wrap up here with uh, these uh, amazing uh, 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 verse here, um, you know, there's that sort of, again, tradition of, you know, the world is intelligibility and Heidegger's uh, essay and um, you know the earth resisting and, 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 and still bringing out mystery wonder within art that takes particulars or things within the world and illuminates the ambiguity or meaning in the mystery of it uh, so that's hence when he says just a theory I don't know what it means and then there's also that you know um, wrapping around with the absolute spirit um, you know, creating the world, a God creating the God, uh, which gives us that sort of objective towards aletheia or truth through those uh, aesthetics. Um, you know, there's a theme of, of Schopenhauer here with um, uh, um, that all is uh, art. That's what he, uh, he actually says at one point in the song. Um, uh, it, it's actually kind of muffled in the background, which is, it, it's really interesting to consider that, um, you know, the hidden variable that all is art, uh, aesthetic arrest for Schopenhauer is what, you know, is the higher uh, being, uh, you know, getting away from that historical natural attitude. 
Um, and so, you know, what did Michael Larson do here? He, you know, he did the act of creating a, a new world for us, for this video to be possible for me to interpret, uh, to then be a world for you to interpret. And thus, uh, as he finishes in the hook here, famously, uh, he once saw a painting that told his whole life story. He witnessed the paradox of the word existing. He once saw a painting that told his whole life story. He colored his world theirs and concluded he wasn't living. He once saw a painting that told his whole life story, the hidden variable that all that is is art. And when I close my eyes, I see eternity as a story. A God imagined the God that imagined me, and I am God, and so on, and so on, and so on. So yeah, he wraps this up here with that, you know, idea of, you know, the artist creates the world within the worlds. Just as Heidegger says, you know, there's the being of beings that comes out that's, you know, trying to uh, make intelligible to us. Um, the artist is the dialogue between God and his people. Uh, and that's why, you know, there's no real causal explanation for you know, why we come around to aesthetics uh, at certain times. It's because, you know, there's a being, uh, the being of beings is uh, trying to communicate with us. So yeah, uh, hopefully you guys really enjoyed this uh, post. Like I said, I, I think uh, Michael Larson's poetry is very rich and very interesting to look at uh, right now in the world, uh, as well as uh, uh, looking at uh, Heidegger's uh, thoughts on art and what good art should actually be. Uh, it's something that I think is uh, interesting for people perhaps in the scene to consider uh, with aesthetics and art. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Uh, enjoy the music if you uh, haven't before, and uh, make sure to subscribe, and I will be back with uh, lectures on uh, Heidegger with uh, Being in Time. So yeah, hope you guys enjoy.